Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And we're, we're glad you can join us, yes, we although are. we are not continuing today in our study of Ephesians. I've taken a brief break from our study in Ephesians to bring a different kind of message. And I'm going to do that right after Alice prays that God will protect me from myself. He will put a guard over my mouth that not one word would come forth from my mouth that he has not put in my heart. And Lord, that ears would be attentive to what you were saying. Amen. That you just said the prayer. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Okay. We just praise you and thank well, you. Well, these were in agreement, eh? Amen. Okay. <laughs> this definitely is going to be a little different. And yes, it is most assuredly uh, motivated by the coronavirus pandemic that is going on in, in our world. It's not our world. No. It's God only. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. The world system, that's man's work. That's right. And it's a, a mess. So, but here, let me, let, me, let me go on and say this. I was just telling Mark, who's over here joining us, as always, and I was saying, you know, what, well, instead of me saying, let me just tell you what happened yesterday. Um, yesterday, let me see. Yeah, March 31st. That's uh, as we're filming now. All right? Today is April 1st, and this is not an April Fool's. That's why I promise you that. In the daily coronavirus update that's done by President Trump here mm -hmm. with his little council of experts and uh, uh, guides, so to speak, Dr. Fauci uh, stood up the, the pandemic expert. And they said, as he stood to Donald Trump, next to Donald Trump, he said that if, and that's a big if, the people of the United States would be truly following the guidelines for social distancing and keeping apart from one another, then they believe that the death in the United States could be held to somewhere between 100 and 240 thousand people between a hundred thousand people and a quarter of a million people that's what they're assuming that under best case scenario that's how many are going to die a far cry from well, i remember in, back in february and towards the end of february when they had one of those coronavirus updates and president trump said when you have 15 people and, and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down close to zero. That's a pretty good job that we've done. That was at a press conference at Donald Trump. Did. Well, 15 people is not where we're at whatsoever. And then on March 10th, now I, you, you may know if you followed us at all, March 9th was Alice's birthday. Happy birthday to you. And birthday month is over. Yes. <laughs> and we were leaving the following day to go out of the country to visit islands in the Caribbean, where we've been many times before. And at that next, on that day, the Coronavirus Council, they said, and this is what Donald Trump said during that meeting, he said, we're prepared and we're doing a great job with it. And it will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. Well, at some point it's going to go away. But not after 15 people have died. And then... I'm going to read one more thing, because while we were away and we were out of the country, on March 19th, we had the opportunity to watch that council again, you know, the Corona up, daily update. And Donald Trump said this on, at that meeting. This was something that happened, and that was, some people would say, an act of God. I don't view it as an act of God. I would view it as just something that happened and just surprised the whole world. And if people would have known about it, it could have been stopped, been stopped in place. Uh, well, I, I don't want to speak evil of a leader of our nation, but the fact of the matter is I think he's wrong on all counts there. It is most assuredly an act of God. Most definitely. <clears throat> most definitely. And it should not have taken believers by surprise. Because as I, by surprise, as I've said before, it's been written 
2,000 years ago it was written, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you for your testing. And I believe this is here and it is testing our faith. Who will we turn to in this time of such a horrible thing? Are we going to turn to the world? Are we going to turn to God? That's the question. Who are we going to turn to? All right, so anyhow, as I said, the White House now projects 100,000 to 240,000 coronavirus deaths. And that's what Donald Trump said, and I'm going to read a quote from him. He said, this could be a hell of a bad two weeks. Trump warns, urging Americans to continue social distancing measures. Okay, so the whole deal is they're saying the key to this now is social distancing. We got to stay apart from one another. I'm going to say this, and I'll come back to this a couple of times. I'm sure. The issue is not me staying apart from you, you staying apart from me, me staying apart from Mark, and Mark staying apart from me, and we're not about to stay apart from one another. The issue is that the that the world has separated itself from God. It has distanced itself from God. And that, my friends, is the root cause of what is going on in our world this day. Amen. You know, a few years ago, maybe three, four years ago, Alice and I were traveling. We were over in, in Europe, uh, in the United Kingdom in Europe. And, and I said to her, because it just struck me, I said, I, I think that we're going to be leaving a time of teaching in the world and be entering a time of prophetic utterance prophecy. Now, if you know the scriptures, you know that at the end, there aren't any teachers around. There are two prophets. And the world doesn't like them one little bit. So Jeremiah, who was most assuredly a prophet of God, wrote in, in his book of Lamentations, and I'm going to read you three verses, all from the uh, second chapter. The Lord has become like an enemy your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has accomplished his word, which he commanded from days of old. That's Lamentations 2, that was verse 5, 14, and 17. The purpose of a prophet it's not to tell you how nice you are, not to tell you that God's going to give you a new car. The purpose of a prophet is that, yes, they will foretell things that God is going to do in the future, but the primary purpose of a prophet has been always to expose your iniquity. Not for condemnation. Our God is not a God of condemnation. But so as to restore you from captivity. To expose your iniquity. Do you know, and I know we've talked about this in a number of our Bible studies in the past on In Search of Christianity, that most of the large churches in the United States of America have become large because they refuse to speak of sin. They don't want anybody to feel that. And I mean, they have said this. That was true of the Crystal Cathedral with Robert Shulman. It was true of Saddleback with Rick Warren. It most assuredly is true of Joel Osteen. And so many large churches, they don't want to talk about sin because that makes people lose their self-esteem. It makes people feel bad. You know what it does? It heals people who will face the truth and repent of their sin. That's what it does. And that's the purpose of sending prophets, to expose the sin, expose the iniquity, so that people will turn to God and be healed. The world, which is in the power of the evil one, that's what it says in 1 John, right? Says that the answer is social distancing, maintaining distance between you and other people. But like I said, the Lord has made it perfectly clear that distancing is the root cause of this whole situation and the death that eventually must follow, right? When we separate ourselves from God. It's not about you staying away from each other, as I said, but it's about mankind distancing, distancing itself from God. Now, this is to the saints and not to the sinners. This one I'm speaking today, and much of what I speak, I'm not saying this to the unsaved. If you are out there and you don't have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have not been saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I do have a quick message for you. 
Turn to Christ. Repent. Fall on your face before God. Because he loves you. He loves you enough that he died on a cross in your place so that you won't have to pay the price of your sin. He did. This message today, as so much of what we do, is to the church, to the quote-unquote believers. So this is about distance and it's about decisions. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. All of all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wants you to come to him. He wants to touch you. You know, I wrote a song um, a number of years ago. What's the name of it? Let me touch you. Let me touch you. That's the name of the song. And uh, you know what? I'm going to put it at the end of this so you can hear it. That's, that's the Lord's desire. Because he wants a relationship with you. He wants an intimate relationship with you. He doesn't want you showing up in a pew, you know, 40 feet from the back of the where the, your altar is. He wants to be with you. You, he, This is a Christianity, I've said this so many times. It's not about padded pews, stained glass windows, and pipe organs. Christianity is a love affair with Jesus Christ. Do you remember the case of the woman that was uh, had the hemorrhage for 12 years? Mm -hmm. And she, as Jesus is walking through in a crowd, she thinks to herself, if I only touch the hem of his garment. Yes. So she walks out, and that's what she does. She touches the hem of his garment, it touches the, the, the end of her robe. And Jesus instantly stops and says, who touched me? He could feel the power. He could him. feel it. He is aware. When he is touched, he is aware of the fact that he yeah. is touched. And he, the power flowed out of him. That woman who had been in darkness for 12 years and never found any, any hope or satisfaction, Jesus touched her and said, it's well. And she was healed on the spot. Yes, she was. What you need, the Lord has. And it will come from you touching him and letting him touch you, not from staying apart. Did you ever read? In James, James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Near, how near? How near does he want to be to you? Does he want to be far from you? No, I don't think so. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. The church has distanced itself from God. I'm telling you the truth. It's not a nice truth, it's not a pretty truth, but it is the truth. The church has decided to do its own thing, do things its own way, and in so doing has separated itself from the Lord God Almighty. Cleanse your hands. You know, that's how we distance ourselves from God, by allowing sin into our life. Because sin, as it says in Isaiah, separates us from God. You want to be separate? You want to be distanced? Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 57, it says that sin separates you from God. And you have to decide about this. You have to, you have to make decisions in your life. You, need, you know what? This is the time people need to make decisions. So many people are not following this, the, the guidelines for this whatsoever. And they're not doing it for any good reason. I mean, we were just talking about before we started, the fact that, you know, at, while, while we were out of the country, it was spring break, and, and here in Florida, I think in Fort Lauderdale, and Daytona Beach, out in, in Panama City, on Padre Island, I know places around the country, you can say, show pictures of these young people, and I say young, they're not, not so childish, you know, and they are packed together, packed together, when the government has already said, stay apart for your safety. So what happens is they gather together, they pile up and, and click, clicks like that. Where do they go when they get through the, the spring break? They have come there from all over the country, and then they disperse and go back all over the country. How do you think this thing spreads? As a matter of fact, one of the hot spots in the country right now, it was just discovered within like last week, is now New Orleans. You know why? You ever hear of Mardi Gras? Look at the pictures 
that are available on this year's Mardi Gras. The streets of Bourbon Street there in downtown New Orleans. These are narrow streets. Narrow streets. Yeah. I mean, literally, people, it reminds me of my days living in New York City and being on the subway. I mean, they're literally packed together. You can't even move. That's not good. You know what that is? Suicide. Oh, uh, that's a good word. But it's also stupid. <clears throat> and not for nothing did Jeremiah say, all mankind is stupid and devoid of knowledge. Okay. And you and know they were gathering, not for anything good. Not for anything, no, no. It's a, That's why it's suicide. I, I don't want to sidetrack myself, but shame on you parents who even allow your sons and daughters to go to spring break. I mean, it's just nothing but a drunken orgy, drug-fueled, booze-fueled orgy. Shame on you. I can't control my Why can't you control your kids? Because they've not been brought up in the ways they should go. That's why. But I'm not, I'm not going to distract myself. I don't think. Madrid, Spain. Another hot spot now. I mean, an incredible hot spot where Spain is just being... Why? Because they had a women's liberation march in Madrid. And tens of thousands of women showed up for this women's march in Madrid. And there, I mean, go on and on, you can find the pictures of this. They, again, are packed together like crazy. It's like they were on a subway. I mean, social distancing? I'm not telling you whether you should, whether you should social distance. I am telling you this. You should have enough sense in you to know that if there is a disease, is it coronavirus a disease? Mark's saying absolutely. I'm playing. It's a play. You should use some sense in dealing with it. And when you know it says contagious, it is that the first thing that struck me about this when we heard about it was how contagious it was. I mean, how rapidly it was. It is phenomenally contagious. So you want to pack people together? Well, no, you're not packing people together. They're packing themselves together. It's idiotic. It is idiocy. So. But if you're going to cleanse your hands, if you're going to get right with God, and you need to cleanse yourself, all right? You have to make decisions. You've got to decide. So let me just read this to you from Joshua. I'm going to read from Joshua 24. I'm going to read verses 15, 14 and 15. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure you've probably heard of this. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable for in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Have you made that decision that you will serve the Lord? I need to just throw this in as an aside. I had the opportunity in quite a number of years ago to um, preach at one of the largest the not one of the largest semin the, nom the largest seminary of a denomination, a mainline denomination up in Georgia. And I had been invited there to speak. And I was speaking, and I have no idea why, because I mean, you know, I don't do an awful lot off the cuff during when I'm teaching in a seminary. I was doing a seminar a seminar in a seminary. But for some reason, I said, I'm looking forward to the day that the men of God will act like men and stand up like Joshua did and speak for their households and say, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And for the first time in all of my years preaching the gospel, they booed. I mean, they booed. They were literally going boo and doing this, putting the thumbs down. This is at a mainline seminary, okay? I, what, what is going on here? Well, it turned out that they were totally engrossed in feminism. Mm -hmm. uh, feminists. As a matter of fact, the dean of the college, the university, was a, a, a woman. Mm -hmm. The pastor of this church was a woman. Mm -hmm. And they were so terribly, terribly offended that I made that statement. I didn't make a statement. So Joshua did. Only when God spoke. 
Joshua did. It didn't seem like God was upset with what Joshua said. How do we get to this place? And this is really, really important. I mean, it wasn't something that I said out of my heart, out of my mind. It was something that I said from the Word of God. And they were booing it. In a place where they teach people to go out and serve as ministers of the gospel. Distanced from God. Distance from God. I just say one other thing. One day, Alice and I were, were driving, we were going someplace, and we were stopped at a red light, and across the, the way from us, there was a cemetery. Oh, yes. And it just it struck me, I mean, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Now, I've done graduate work in a seminary. God protected me from that. Yes, he did. Um, but I was looking at the cemetery, and it just dawned on me. You know, everybody in that cemetery, they know the truth. Amen. For better or for worse, now they know the truth. That's better than most places that are seminaries. Because they don't know, they don't all know the truth. No, they don't. Don't wait till you're dead to know the truth. Because Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the way and he is the life. And his word is truth. Get into it. Don't turn away from his word. I'm going to read now from 1 Kings 18. I'm going to read, start at verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab. Now Ahab was not a nice guy, right? He was a king of Israel. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Therein lies the problem. When you forsake the commandments of the Lord. It's simple. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But you have to love the whole world. You can't pick and choose the parts you like to love. You have to accept the, the fact that God's word is truth. And he knows better and more than you. All right? So now I'm talking about Elijah. But here, here is the king of Israel calling Elijah, one of the most powerful prophets that has ever lived, mm -hmm. and saying, calling him the troubler of Israel. Why do you think in the people of God, in Israel, and still today, they kill the prophets? That's right, because the prophets expose their iniquity. And you know what? You don't want your sin out in the light unless you have a heart after God and are willing to repent. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? This is on Mount Carmel. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. He's saying, hey, Listen, if you don't want to follow God, follow Baal. The people didn't answer. Why? They were ashamed. That's why. They were caught in a trespass. The Valley of Decision. You ever hear of the Valley of Decision? Mm -hmm. Sometimes called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Otherwise known as the Valley of Kidron. That's down in Jerusalem. Between the Temple Mount. Between the city of Jerusalem and the, uh, the Mount of Olives. Is that important? Yes, everything's important. Where's the world's the world going? Armageddon? Wait a minute. Armageddon is a battle that takes place in at Har Megiddo, Megiddo. That's north. The final battle takes place in the Valley of Decision. It always winds up in the Valley of Decision. The decisions that you choose to make what decisions do you have to choose to make? What decisions do you need to make right now? And maybe you need to make it more than once. John spoke and he wrote in his first letter and he said, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
The world is passing away, did you notice? And also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. If you think you're a Christian, you know what? It's all about being a child of God. It's all about being part of the family of God. How do you know if you're part of the family of God? Well, Jesus said, those who do the will of my father, they are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. Are you doing the will of God? Do you know the will of God? It's here. It's in the Word of God. It's here. It's all here. How much time are you spending in the Word? This is not a joke. This is life and death. You adulteresses, this is God speaking to his people. You adulteresses through James. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, that is the word of God. You cannot have it both ways. Yet you're going to be in the world, but not of the world. You are here as an ambassador of Christ. You are here on this planet right now to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. To show people the love and the mercy of God. You are here to bring that presence of God. You are not here to have a nicer time, to have a better job, to have a nice boat, to have a nice car, to have a nice... You are here to serve the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And if you're not doing that, you are irresponsible. And when this plague is done, you better not want to go back to normal. No. Or maybe you should go back to real normal. Mm -hmm. That's right. Real normal is the word of God. Carpenter's square. Everything else is perverted and corrupt. You know, I've heard, Alice and I get, uh, have had the opportunity, we've traveled many, 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 many places on many countries and many different churches. And I hear so many people talking about in the last days there's going to be this magnificent, great revival. Everybody's going to come to the Lord. What Bible are you reading? I mean, there's a lot of junk Bibles out there, a lot of really, really bad translations. But I still think it'd be hard put to find that. Because I'm going to tell you what the, what the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about apostasy, not revival, in the last days. Jesus said it. When the apostles, they were leaving the temple and they came to Jesus and said, tell us, tell us, what are going to be the signs of the last days? What's going to be happening in these terrible last days? And at that time, Jesus said, many will fall away and be, will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Matthew 24, 10 and 11. Let me tell you something. You can't fall away from someplace you've never been. Have you ever been in danger of falling away from the, falling off the Empire State Building? Not have you not been to the top yet, haven't? So then, Paul, in that same line of thought, writes to the church in Thessalonica, and he says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. Many will fall away. Do you, do you know if you're in the right place with Jesus Christ? Now I'm going to tell you something. Unless you are in a close relationship with Jesus Christ, talking to him day by day, you can be deceived. Satan is a liar by nature and the father of lies, and he comes as an angel of light. And how much more his ministers, they come, all these false prophets. Because one of the most horrific verses in the Bible that I see is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is the most beautiful sermon in the Bible. I mean, go, go read it, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But Jesus talks about that final day. And he says, many will come to me. Many will come to me on that day. Saying, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. 
We cast out demons, we did this, we prophesied, we did this, we did that. And he'll say to them, depart from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. What? How can that be? How can that be? Because they were deceived. But you know, the clue is right there in this. They come to Jesus Christ. He still has nails to our hands. Because they're going to be saying, where did you get those wounds? In the house of his friends, not from... And they're going to come to Jesus Christ, who died on that cross just for them, and say to him, look what I did. Look what I did. I did this. I prophesied. Are you nuts? How can you do that? How can you come to Jesus Christ and start to talk about what you've done? You had better humble yourself now and be in the habit of humility. The habit of humility. Because you're going to need it when you come to the presence of Jesus Christ. But many are going to fall away. Why? Is, what's the cause of people falling away? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to read you another verse. I'm going to read you a couple of verses from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, and it says, These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. His word is too difficult when it's rightly divided. When it's rightly divided, when you get the whole word. You know, a half a word can be a whole lie. You know, it says in the Bible, there is no God. It says it two or three times. But what it says is, only the fool says in his heart, there is no God. You've got to, you can't take it out of context. So many churches, as I mentioned, they're just not, they will not talk about sin because it turns people away. How can you talk about sin and build a mega church? How can you do that? I mean, the masses, at the end of the day, didn't follow Jesus. It was those few who were willing to pay the price. Do you know that greed, and oh my goodness, aren't we surrounded by greed? Greed is idolatry. How do you think the Lord feels about idolatry? God hates divorce. There are six things which the Lord hates, yea, even seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, that's pride, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lie, lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. That's Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. And then I'm going to read about Revelation chapter 21. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 21. Now, I'm not going to read you all of the sins in the Bible, because so I don't need to do that. I'm going to tell you something. There is some Homosexuality is a sin, by the way. It's a sin. It's not about love. It's about sex. God commands us. God commands me to love men. I love Mark over there. I'm not going to have sex with him. It doesn't require sex. Love is not about sex. Love is about love. Sex in a right relationship is a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing in a right relationship. But I'm, I'm, I, like I said, I don't want to go through and list all the sins in the world. And I don't need to, okay? But remember, it says in Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. I don't know. I'm not going to name my sins, but I promise you, I've sinned. And I promise you, so have you. You are called to examine yourself. To see if you're walking in faith. You will not have to examine yourself for sin. This is what I'm saying. You should examine yourself to see if you're walking in faith. You should examine yourself to see, because you should have a great desire to please God.
But there's somebody who will do that, expose your sin for you. It's not just the prophets, because they do it out of love. And they do it so that you'll be restored. But there's another one who loves condemnation. The serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, the accuser of our brethren, has been thrown down. He who accuses them before God, day and night. That's in the book of Revelation. He's always accusing you. So what do you do? Repent, and it's gone. Pew! But it's having repentance from your heart. If you repent of your sin, it's gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's what it says in Psalm 103, verse 12. It's gone. It, it, was doesn't, a, it doesn't mean saying, I'm sorry. No, it's more, it's more than that. So those are just the words that come out. Remember that the words that come out are, and if they're not what's in, that's in your heart. In heart. Yes. And God is searching our hearts. He knows the truth. And he we, knows the truth, yes. Yeah, he knows what we're, if we're lying. You know, if you, if you love somebody and you do something wrong mm -hmm. against them, and it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't pain you, you don't love that person. If you love Jesus Christ and you sin, somewhere along the line, when, when it comes to you, that should pain you. I promise you, it pains him. Except for the fact that he hung on that cross and he said, it is finished. He paid the price for your sin. He became your sin. And it was your sin that was nailed to the cross. Hallelujah. That's cause for rejoicing. Jesus said this. Oh, this is God speaking. Isaiah 43, verse 25. A verse I've always loved since the first time I read it. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 43, he's not going to remember your sins. He's not going to remember your sins. He's wiped them out. They're gone. As far as the east is from the west. He was the Lamb of God that was slain for your sins. But there's a scapegoat. And that scapegoat bore your sin and carried it off. So it says, and I just, I just mentioned this, in John 19.30 it says, Therefore when Jesus had received the sour wine at the end of the crucifixion, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I pray that God would send prophets into our lives to expose our iniquity. Not for condemnation, but so that we would face it and repent of it and be restored from captivity. Because your sin makes you a captive. Do you not know that? Let me read you Romans 6.16. Do you not know? That when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Romans 16, 6, 16. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, no man can serve two. You're going to serve somebody. You're going to serve somebody. You are either serving God or you are serving the devil. You're serving the devil, you're not serving God. Period. Hallelujah. It is time for us to face the truth. It's time for us to recognize that we have distanced ourselves from God by our sin, by our habits, by our practices. I mean, so many churches that I've been in, it goes in, it's like going into a nightclub. Is there a right way to worship? You bet there's a right way to worship. It's called in spirit and in truth. Listen, examine yourself. Pray. Pray that God would send people. He would speak into your life and show you anything that is not of him so that you would turn from it, so that you would change your mind, change your heart, change your practice. If you don't think we're coming to an end, you're just not paying attention. You're just not paying attention. This is serious stuff that's going on right now. They're talking about here in this country, 
that they estimate, like I said, that if they don't behave, somewhere between 100,000 and 240,000 will die. If you don't behave, it goes up into the millions. Will you be one? Will you be one? You have no assurance, by the way. I have a blessed assurance. My blessed assurance is of eternal life. Could I get the coronavirus and die? No, I can get the coronavirus virus and get transformed, transmitted. But I'm not. I'm, I'm not immune from the things that happen to the human body. But I am immune from sin. I've been inoculated against sin. I have been injected with the blood of Jesus Christ, and I am safe and secure from all alarm. You need to ask yourself: Are you living the Word of God? Or are you conforming it to you rather than you being conformed to it? These are perilous last days. Fool around at your own risk. Avoid the commands of God at your own risk. Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for your patience. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the joy that you've given us. I thank you for a peace that you've given us that passes all understanding. I thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much, Father. That you sent Jesus to die in our place, to become our sin nailed to that cross. Lord, help us to live that in the fullness of faith, that we might be pleasing to you in everything that we do, in every way, in every day. I praise you and thank you for your word, your word made flesh who dwelt among us. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you and goodbye until next time. Live the Word. Rejoice in the Word. Be an example of the Word and show the Word made flesh to all of the world that you come in contact with. Don't social distance from Jesus Christ. Grab Him. Grab Him. Hang on. Hold close. God bless you and goodbye. Come to me All you